the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. I cannot pledge allegiance to a country built on lies. Or raise my children to believe they're equal in its eyes. My leaders are assassinated for speaking their mind. So justice never tilts my way. I thought that she was blind. Isn't this America? Or is this America? some difficult days ahead but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop good day I am Denise DePinari co-host of at the round table with Mamlil a Massachusetts Association minority law enforcement offices incorporated broadcast and we greatly appreciate our sponsors John B Cruz construction company one John Elliott Square Roxbury Massachusetts third generation family owned, founded in 1948 to provide superior customer service and a quality product for its clients and tenants. Everyone's going green and you should too. That's the law offices of Donald E. Green located in the heart of Roxbury at 2235 Washington Street in Dudley Square, soon to be called Nubian Square, 617-442-0050 and also 500 North Main Street, Unit B, Randolph, Massachusetts, 02386. Last but not least, our newest sponsor, Residential Mortgages Services, will guide you home. 91 Franklin Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02110. Contact Senior Loan Officer Cora Holbrook at 781-664-6200. That's Cora.Holbrook at rmsmortgage.com without their sponsorship this broadcast would not be possible thank you and have a great day there was an account in scripture where there were two good morning this is wbbglp 102.9 fm at the round table with mamlio it is saturday july 13th i am your host denise depina reed with my co-host larry ellison and pierre solomon good morning good. everyone good morning pierre it's actually our guest this morning um dr bradley just went out to <laughs> yeah to we're all running valet. around right take care of you he'll be back on the mic uh, in the on the air in a few seconds uh, you're at the round table with Mamlu. Our call in number is 617-282-0685 and 617-282-7794. You are at the round table with Mamlu. We want to welcome our guest, Pierre Solomon of Solomon Firearms Training LLC, located in Swansea, Mass. Uh, he is going to tell folks, educate you on how you uh, the training that they conduct there and getting people prepared to get their LLC uh, to carry. Um, and we're going to get into that. So, uh, Pierre, first of all, welcome and uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Pierre, founder and CEO of Solomon Fire Training. Uh, okay. We, we, we one more time. We, Denise didn't have you up on the mic. So, there you we'll, go. Like, one, we'll start over. Hey, good morning. Thank you for right having there. me. Uh, my name is Pierre, founder and CEO of Solomon Firearms Training and Overwatch Security. Um, so I'm I'm grateful for you having me here on the air. So Peter, tell us a little bit about uh, Solomon Firearms. Um, how, when this became, uh, you founded this organization, this business, and um, what made you go, ahead, go into this type of business? Yeah, so we started in uh, February 2014, and. It was, um, my love for firearms kind of started with the military, so I never handled a firearm. I never shot anything until I joined the Army. Uh, third day in boot camp, uh, they gave me an M16, and I was like, oh, cool, this is like Call of Duty. <laughs> you know, so that was my first introduction to firearms. So I never legally or illegally, you know, had any interaction with firearms, only video games. And then through the military, you know, I developed this love for firearms and, you know, the sense of community and leadership and all these, you know, attributes and, you know, values that the military 
aspire to teach you. So, um, so then I came back home and I just started doing what I love. I got my license to carry, started shooting at the range, brought a couple of friends with me and stuff. And after a while, I'm like, okay, you got to pay me for ammo because, mm. you know, it cost, <laughs> it cost that's, that's, to shoot. That's right. And yeah. they started bringing their friends and I'm like, all right, you know, it's only like $20, you yeah. know, you know, a little side hustle. Right. And then eventually I realized that, that there was a huge demand for my knowledge and skills and what I thought was normal was not normal and was much needed in our community. Mm. So I, so that's how I really uh, got started. So I, I developed the passion before the business idea. So you turned a hobby into a, a business now how many people you have employed yeah. um well i do the work mostly myself uh, i'm also an nra training counselor which allows me to uh, what is that so NRA? that is so that NRA, NRA, NRA training training counselor allows me to create is that the national rifle association yes okay yes uh it allows me to create um, um nra instructors so not only do we do the basic student courses we can also offer the instructor courses to, for people who could be able to teach others so um, I have instructors that work with me, but they don't necessarily directly work for me. And so what are the hours of operation at your facility? Uh, <laughs> technically, we're open 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., but, you know, I run two businesses. I'm up uh, most of the day, so we so run it's a 24-hour operation. Okay. So <laughs> is this an indoor or outdoor uh, range? Uh, so training facilities, so we have partnerships with different ranges okay. in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. So uh, we establish relationships with them, and then we're allowed to bring our students. And, you know, it's a, it, it's a beneficial um, okay. opportunity so for let, both. So let's, let's back up. For, so what you do uh, initially when folks come in and contact you is more the classroom type of training before you take them out to the uh, the facilities that you contract with. Yes, yeah, yeah. So they have to, I'm so good. Yeah, they have to take a five-hour safety course. Okay. So we go through the class. We teach them about mass laws for, you know, carrying a license to carry. We go through loading, unloading, firearm nomenclature, mm. safety rules, and things like that. Mm. We make sure that they're really safe and comfortable before they go out to the range and handle a firearm. So people are out there listening, and they're saying, okay, um, this sounds great, right? And particularly people of color have had always somewhat had an issue with getting a license to carry what would be the pre-existing uh the pre-qualifications for someone like if someone to just come in wanting to get a license an llc uh, a license to carry i should say um what are the disqualifiers like should i not waste my time contacting you if this is my ambition if i have certain issues in my past well, I think if you have certain issues in your past, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a waste of time. Uh -huh. You know, there are laws and, you know, there are federal disqualifiers. So, for example, if you have a felony, you know, if you have an active restraining um, order or if you have any warrants and stuff like that and interaction with the law. But just because you've been arrested or, you know, you had a misdemeanor, that doesn't necessarily automatically disqualify you. So, like, mm -hmm. the felonies and stuff, they automatically disqualify you. But if you have a misdemeanor or if you were arrested for something or you beat a case. So, so when you look at the law, it, it, it's about conviction, right? So, mm -hmm. you could be accused of something and you could be found not guilty. So, Good if you're point. found not guilty, then you're, you know, you can exercise the Second Amendment rights. And then every day the laws are changing, you know. So, we know the way that law enforcement is applied to the black community. is That's where I was going. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's not equal. So, you're, you're, so, there's a lot of laws changing, you know, hey, if you're felon, can you vote can you get all these things so you're looking at our society where they're giving people back their rights and they're saying hey it's wrong it's unconstitutional for someone you know to be punished for a crime and then still 20 years later they're still not able to exercise their right to vote mm -hmm. freedom of speech and stuff like that so um our society is changing in that aspect so there are different <coughs> levels so let's say i'm not someone who wants to uh carry a firearm for protection i'm i'm an avid hunter is that something that you get people prepared for at, at different levels of, of uh, firearms training? Yeah, so there's different contexts for using a firearm. Uh, we always tell people we're not here to tell you how to feel about firearms. We're just here to teach and educate you. And then you, you decide on, on, on yourself, by yourself, you know, the best way to use that firearm. So if you just want to leave the firearm in, you know, in your safe in your bedroom, just in case someone breaks in, cool. If you want to learn how to carry and, you know, carry concealed and do that properly, be able to draw from the holster, we do offer advanced courses besides that basic class for you to take. But um, it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with. And, and, and we meet people where they're at we never try to force anything on them 617-282-0685 617-282-7794 you're listening at the round table in studio gets pierre solomon of solomon firearms and training llc located in swansea math so pierre 
uh, I'm, I'm a novelist, pretend I'm not a police officer, mm-hmm. and I contact you. What are the first steps and requirements for me? And I come in, and, and how long is this class? Is it is it five hours in class, and then yeah, five hours in okay. class, and then what does that entail? Time. So, so somebody calls, say, hey, I'm interested in getting my license to carry. I'm like, sure. You know, we schedule a time. I uh, tell them what's included into the class. So they they come into class, they fill out the waiver. The waiver would tell them all the disqualifiers. So we okay. go over all that stuff. And you know, if it applies to you. We have a discussion if you have to leave you leave if not then you just continue so the course goes over you know you know safety rules for handling firearms mm-hmm. obviously you know these are things that do have the ability to take away a human life so it's important that you treat it with the proper respect and follow the safety rules mm-hmm. so in class um, the first course is mo- mostly about safety identifying what type of firearm you know different platforms handguns revolvers shotguns rifles you know learning how to load and unload them safely and talking about mass mass storage loss so in that aspect when someone's first starting we're not talking about any type of tactical training or anything like that it's mostly about how do you be safe and responsible and follow all the legal requirements that comes with gun ownership so a couple of questions i have on my um one uh so i come in do you do a background check on these folks that come in? Because, like you said, we were talking. There are some disqualifiers, and people aren't always up for up front with you. Is there anything that you do, or you just take them through the process? If they say, "I want to take your course," you just put them through that, and it's up. It's up to them to be to- totally honest with you, so they're not really wasting any time or yours. And the other question is, I think that people aren't as aware of with firearms, which you just spoke about, is the storage safety. And responsibility like I think that's that's probably the most crucial thing the liability of what you're talking about of having a firearm and not understanding the proper storage uh, that you you're, you're gonna be held liable if, if something happens with that firearm even though you're licensed to carry it yeah so I'll answer the first part of your question so yeah we don't have a legal responsibility or authority to do a background okay. check right so people have to authorize you to look into their private information what the law requires is that we take reasonable measures to prevent unauthorized persons so I can't knowingly give someone who's unauthorized to handle a firearm that thing so when a person fills out a form and, 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 and waiver they're you know they're, they're le- it, it's a legally binding document so yes you can lie but then that's a felony right so you're not allowed to you know if you're a person who um who who's not supposed to be using firearms if you're caught doing that then you're going to face jail time and, and we keep accurate records for seven years so if law enforcement ever says hey did this person come here and stuff and i'll say yep he signed a waiver he said that none of this applied to him he was a person of good repute and stuff like that so our part is to do reasonable measures to prevent unauthorized access mm-hmm. so yeah we we don't have the legal responsibility or the authority to um pull up people's personal information that's that's interesting because someone could come in and and misrepresent themselves but just to familiarize themselves with the firearm knowing legally because a lot of times if if i'm a person of ill repute that's not a concern of mine anyways but it also but it's an opportunity for them to kind of get themselves familiar with the firearm through this training because they signed a waiver that they're being truthful with you when they're actually not well, you can't go for it any any more than that. So if you have a you know an active you know warrant on you and you go to a police station to apply for your license to carry, uh, you're, you're not walking out of there. No, no. But I, what I mean is the training that you you uh, supply to them, um, making them familiar with the weapon, that could still take place even having all of this in my past. Um, yeah, I'm I not mean, not not holding yeah, you accountable. I'm saying that someone could actually walk in the door and get the training they need. They may not get a firearm license, but they've been trained on how to use the weapon. Yeah, so like I personally, you know, can't you know eliminate our risk. We can only right. mitigate it, right. right? You can apply for a job and say, hey, I have all this experience mm-hmm. and lie on your resume, and right. then you get the job, and then you find out the guy, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't do it. So that yeah. applies to you know right. any aspect of okay. life, you know. So you said this this training is broken down into five hours, right? Yep. So the first I come in, what's that first hour in from from the first hour to the end? Uh, it's all about it? safety rules. So you okay. got your three fundamental safety rules: always keep the fire point in safe direction, always keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot, always keep the gun unloaded until ready to use, right? So you're always assuming that that firearm is loaded and understanding how to be safe with that initially. Mm-hmm. Then we talk about you know your eight rules for using and storing a gun, you know, and, you know. And what are some of those just for people out there? who probably need to be familiarized with it who have it but like with uh with police with law enforcement we're required to train and a little bit more than the average citizen and people have firearms in their home they have children they have other folks who are sometimes naturally curious when they locate them what are some of the safeguards that you tell people that they should be doing 
if they are legally in possession of a firearm. Yeah, so make sure you have a safer to store your firearms. So whether you use a cable lock, a lock box, or a safe or something like that, you got a couple of different options. You know, do these things can go from twenty dollars to two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So depend depending on your economic situation, you might be only be able to do a certain things. But Mass Law says, hey, these are the the certain legal ways that you have to do. Right. So when you purchase a firearm, it comes with a cable lock. So if you actually run that cable lock through the barrel and you lock it up, even if a child finds that firearm, you know, if you keep your firearm separate from your ammunition one day the firearm is going to be locked and two there's no ammo so therefore that child can't hurt themselves the other aspect to that too is we talk about parents or you know I mean you don't even have to be a parent you could be an elder brother you could have a little cousin or something like that we talk about having an age appropriate conversation with children so one of the things that we we all say that curiosity kills the cat right so whatever age that child is you have a age appropriate conversation the NRA has a program called the Eddie Eagle program which teaches kids stop don't touch run away tell a grown up so it's okay to tell your child that you have a firearm it's like any other risk in in the house right Mm -hmm. so you got knives you got the stove you got the iron you know you got electrical outlets right so we go through our lives as parents and and older siblings guiding those young children through the different dangers that's in the home and outside the home the firearm is just one of those discussions that you need to have and say hey here's another thing in the home you have to be careful about if you have any questions come here i'll teach you in a safe and legal manner so that way you don't have to go anywhere else and you know and get information through deviant means so at, at whatever age that child is you have that age of appropriate conversation and you may have to have that several times in our lives mm-hmm. right just like you know when we're talking about you know you know when kids like hey where do babies come from you tell them a conversation when they're five seven well, you mean you it's <laughs> not the store <laughs> yeah and then you have that conversation again when they're 13 when they have a little bit more complex right. you know understanding right. of the world so it's the same thing with a firearm you may have yeah. a young child and then you know simple you know answers may suffice but when they get older and they start interacting and you know running into different groups of people you know you should it should be a continuous conversation throughout the entire life 617-282-0685 617-282-7 nine four you're at the round table with Mamlio. Our in studio guest Pierre Solomon of Solomon Firearms and Training LLC located in Swansea Mass. So Pierre, what's the age minimum age for someone to take your course? Or, um, or is there one? Well, there is no legal minimum age. Okay. So I always tell people, even if your child, right, you, you can start training your child at one, two years old, okay. right? So even if they're not physically able to handle the firearm, you can give them that education portion. Right? Mm-hmm. You can tell them, hey, this is how you handle firearm. Never put your finger on the trigger. Always know your target and what lies beyond. So even though that child may not physically be able to handle the firearm, you can give them years of education prior to that so that when they are physically able and they are mature enough to follow direction that they can handle it um we train as young as 10 years old okay. and 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 we tell parents um the child has to be able to follow direction so if they're you know 10 and they can't follow direction then they're not ready for the training because you know it, it, it is so a don't you assignment. experience that with some of your adults too <laughs> well yeah <laughs> yeah we do have some big kids you know? <laughs> but I, I have a quick question yeah. as you train at, at 10 years old i I see this image in my mind where a, a, a firearm instructor was training this young lady to call, to handle a um, an automatic weapon, and she in the turf, she missed and fired it and hit him and killed him. So, is there any certain type of weapon that they are at that age that you will not train them on, or is it? Is it just oh yeah, absolutely yeah. Okay. So you have to gauge that individual student okay. right and see what the individual ability is. So that was a new shooter. So I wouldn't give that type of firearm to a new shooter. If you're talking about a young child, you'll give him like a you know 22 caliber. So there's different calibers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I saw that video as well. There's a couple of them out there. But giving a new shooter a full auto to shoot, that's not good, right? So you start him off on a low caliber 22 caliber firearm, and then you do him on like a single shot bolt action mm-hmm. rifle or mm-hmm. a single action revolver. Where where you can only fire one round at a time and you have to manually cock the hammer. Okay. So when okay. you're talking about young shooters and new shooters, you start them on manual loading firearms before you go to semi-automatic. Okay. I, I asked that question to myself. Why would you give a child an automatic weapon and try to teach a uh, semi-automatic and see, teach this child with all that you know, recall uh, how to shoot this weapon? You know, And that's what the, kid, the guy was doing. He was actually trying to show this young girl how to shoot 
an auto like I think an AR-15, yeah, or something like that. And it's like, why would you? Why would you do that? You know, it yeah, didn't that, make any sense. Yeah, that instructor majors have been a little bit more ambitious, okay. Mm-hmm. And that also goes back to training, right? Knowing the ability and capabilities of, of your student and your shooter, and also knowing what appropriate firearm is good for them. Okay. So, like I stated, all manual loading firearms and low caliber, twenty-two caliber for new shooters. And and the way we work in our company is we have to earn, right? So if you want to shoot a bigger caliber, you have to show that you can handle, you can be safe, and that you have the accuracy and capability to handle that small caliber. Okay. Once you handle that twenty two, then we can talk about, you know, bumping you to a nine millimeter or something okay. like that. So is it a check off list that you have, you know, when you're when you're doing some kind of evaluation of of a younger uh, student, it's okay. She's shooting a or he's shooting a twenty two. But these are the things that I want to see to make to oh, show yeah, that he or she can handle that that weapon before we move to the next. Yeah, absolutely. And safety is the main <clears throat> thing, right? So are they safe? Are they keeping that fire and putting it on a safe direction? Are they keeping their finger off the trigger until ready to shoot? Okay. Are they keeping that gun unloaded? If they're following the safety rules, great. Now we can move on to the next step, okay? How is their skill level? Are they skillfully handling the firearm? Mm-hmm. Are they, you know loading in it unloading it correctly how's the accuracy so we continuously go through that process once that's satisfactory then we can talk about okay you understand all these right and then you've developed the skill you're good at it mm-hmm. now we can talk about moving on to the skill level there's, okay. there's a perception uh, about black men and guns Okay. Do you talk about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. So we do host, you know, African American firearm safety courses where we're specifically targeting the African American community. And there's this, this profession. I mean, there's this perception that you know, if you're a black man with a gun, you know, you're a thug, gangbanger, and stuff like that. Um, I chalk that up to lack of education, resources, and facilities where you know people of color can legally and professionally learn about firearms and 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 develop that positive relationship. So if you look at other communities. Uh, um, you know, more obviously white communities, you know, they train their kids very young. Their kids go hunting and they have a safe relationship with firearms. Why can't our community and our children have that? Why does it have to be the narrative that, oh, if you're a young black teen with a firearm, then you're that you're involved in gangs. So part of our mission is to change that narrative and say, hey, you can be a black family and you can own a firearm safely, you know, for self-protection, for employment, you know, for hunting education or, or just recreational, you know, shooting a firearm at the range is fun. So um, by providing, you know, professional services, you're allowing someone who's interested in firearm the legal way to use it and the opportunity and a space to, you know, to learn and be safe about it. So uh, my question, you know, it always gets down to dollars and cents. What would be the cost if I walked into your establishment for this five hour course? Well, the course is 150 that includes the five hours, that includes oh, okay. the certification, yeah. that includes the guns and ammo. So we provide everything to you. So if you have anybody under 18, they get 25% off. So the miners get discount. Uh, military law that enforcement. That seems to be more than reasonable. How are you making any money, bro? Uh, <laughs> uh, support. People can tell when you're passionate about what you uh-huh. do. So, um, you know, we offer 25% off as well for military law enforcement, EMT, and fire. Um, but, yeah, you know, so we establish good relationship and, you know, we have a lot a, um, we have a high retention rate so people enjoy their time and they're able to come back and that's what really keeps us in business is our students coming back getting more training and then you know supporting our our cause and our organization so the five if you don't go, go if you, i'm sorry if no you don't, if you don't mind telling us who evaluates you i mean who, who makes sure that your you your your operation is 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 uh is correct is there, is there like an oversight yeah, so, uh, so, so, organization? So I'm Mass State Police certified. So, okay. so you have to go through a background check. You have to be approved by Mass State Police. Okay. You also have to take instructor courses as well. Okay. So like um, anybody can teach. Like like you can bring a friend to the range and show mm. them how to shoot, mm. but you're not a certified instructor. Okay. To go to that, you have to go through an instructor course. You have to shoot. You have to qualify. You have to pass, you know, two written exams. So we offer the instructor courses as well. Okay. So, um, so you have to go through all that before you go around Good. and start certifying people and giving them certificates. And so you, before, I know Dr. Bradley had to run out for a second, but you have a military background. I want to thank you for your service. Uh, thank um, you for your support. Uh, for, which for which branch? Well. 
Army best friends. Hey, 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 hey. There we go. Watch it over there. Now, There's yeah. a Navy person yeah. in here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now he's I'm your sorry best. to hear. What MOS? <laughs> sorry what to M- hear. Uh, uh, MOS did you have? What MOS? Uh, you I'm have? a 74 Delta, so I do seaburn, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, uh, uh, nuclear warfare. Yeah, I was 72 Echo. I was uh, in, in comm center communication. You see how nice. quickly the conversation has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, brothers in arms, man. Yeah, right. Brothers in arms. Your credentials, you don't even need him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He's yeah. all set. Yeah, he's army <laughs> man. He's good. He's good. He's good. You're listening to At the Round Table with Bam Lil. Call it number 617 Our studio guest, Solomon. Pierre Solomon of Solomon Firearms and Training LLC. Uh, he's been uh, gracious enough to come in and, and try to educate folks. Uh, I, and I, it's a very important topic because I think a lot of times uh, people take more caution with their computer and safeguarding people not accessing their computer than they do something that is a lot more dangerous. And even though a computer is dangerous because you, know, you can get under different people, but it's not going to kill you as instantly as that firearm. And I think the safety piece, I think sometimes people, um, I always tell people they're repetitive. Like I'm being in law enforcement, I have a safe at home. I have young children, a young child and, you know, friends come over. She's still at that young age, but I'm in a habit. I, every day, no matter when I come in, there's that routine. And that's the only time I'll kind of have a routine when I, as far as law enforcement is, immediately after the hugs and kisses is i go and secure that firearm Mm -hmm. so that i'm not i'm never wondering (coughs) where it is you know i don't put it up anywhere where it's not it i have a safe two safes uh one it's it's a bigger one when i'm traveling and going away and the other one is that if i need to get to it but it's secure and i think people don't take as much precaution sometimes on the safety because they figure well I know where it is, and I'm the only one that knows where it is, mm. and the kids can't get to it, and then that tragedy takes place. So can you talk a little bit more about the safeguarding of these weapons for people, what they should be doing? One of the first things I think they should do, like I said, even if it's just that $20 lock, and I know exactly what you're talking about. It looks like a, a wire going through there, but if it, it keeps anyone from firing or loading that weapon mm-hmm. yeah so um not something we talk about in our class too we show videos so when we talk about the safety rules we always show a video of somebody who who didn't follow that so we always tell our students if you don't follow the safety rules you're going to end up in one of three places you're going to end up in a wheelchair a jail cell or a coffin mm-hmm. so when we're giving these courses you know unfortunately you know we live in a social media age all these things are being caught on camera now mm-hmm. so then you can turn around show that video in the class and says hey here's someone here's a news story of someone who didn't follow that safety rule I don't want you to be that person yeah. so it's important so we instill the value and the importance of following those safety rules but yeah uh, cable locks um, they come with the firearm so there should be a locking device that's actually mandated by federal law and and and, and the state of Massachusetts so you'll get that cable lock or, or a trigger lock which mm-hmm. prevents the person from being able to pull that trigger um, you know, and so they wouldn't be able to fire that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we do talk about, you know, balancing the, the desire for access and security. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, you want to be able to access your firearm quickly because you don't want to have a trigger lock and then have it in a lockbox and have it in a safe mm-hmm. in your closet door and then the door closet right. door is locked because <laughs> when the bad guy breaks <laughs> in your home, <laughs> you know, right. now you're engaging right. in hand-to-hand combat. Right. So you, there's that delicate balance of, of safety and, you know, accessibility. But at a minimum, you should be using a trigger lock Right. cable lock and um there's even these small safes that you can have on your nightstand you know they're you know they, they can read your fingerprints right. and things That's like why that I have one of those, yeah. so so um due to modern technology you have a lot of different options that mm. aren't really expensive right. that you can use just to prevent that physical access so yeah so that's extremely important right for um for people to do that because right. i think there's a myth that people think that only people who have firearms illegally are are uh, uh, unsafe with them right that mm-hmm. uh, don't take exercise cautions because they figure hey, if i get caught with that that's the least of my problems <laughs> right is it's, it's that right that more often than not these things take place with people who are legally licensed to carry a firearm these these accidents take place one thing I heard you mention that you uh, are you a member of the NRA? I heard you mention the NRA. Are yes. you a member because uh, Dr. Bradley might move away from you a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am. I am I a know, member of the, the NRA. National Rifles. I noticed the hat. I noticed. Uh, the hat. Oh, you know, <laughs> uh, I gotta ask you: Do you frequent? Because I don't. I, are there many people of color who are members of the NRA? 
Um, there are. So there are many people of, of color that Do are members tell. Of, <laughs> of the NRA. Um, like all things of... Well, I noticed your chair <laughs> didn't push this way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the NRA, like all organizations, have you know the ups and downs. They have their strengths and their weaknesses. But I think the overall, the impact that I can have in the community overrides any type of personal disagreement that I that I do have, that I may have with them. So, do I agree with everything that the NRA does? Absolutely not. Who agrees with, with anything that anybody does? But my ability to train and certify. Uh, you know, people of color and all people in the ability to get their firearm and also as the ability as the NRA training council to create instructors, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the other important part too. How do we change this narrative that, hey, if you're a black person with a firearm, then you're a criminal. You do that by certifying, you know, black instructors to mm-hmm. go into black communities and teaching them the laws and how to be law-abiding citizens when it comes to firearms. So that aspect is important. Mm-hmm. So for me, I look at it as if you take the NRA organization, so let, let's say, okay, uh, you know, I have a personal gripe with the NRA. I'm not going to use their certifications, and I'm going to, you know, burn their membership card. What other tool am I going to use to accomplish what I'm accomplishing in the community? And and the answer is there is no other tool. Mm-hmm. And so the NRA certificates and these certifications they're weaved into the law. They're nationally mm-hmm. recognized. So I can go to Florida. I can mm-hmm. go to another state, <laughs> and I could use that certificate to apply for a license to carry. I don't have to retake that course. Mm-hmm. So. So the impact that I'm able to do, um, I think, is more important than any personal philosophy that, that people have. And, 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 and we're not here to sell NRA membership. We're here to do the firearm training. Yeah. So you don't have to be a member of the NRA to, you know, to take a course and use your, to, your certificate to apply. So with that said, Dr. Bradley, he's over there. Yes, Ben Kane has said, most firearm instructors are going to be members of the NRA for various me- reasons. It's hard to be an instructor and not be a member of the mm. NRA. And, and Dr. Bradley over there was just smiling. So I, well, you, you, was, you, was. Either, you either won him over or you no, or, well, or or, that or smile went upside well, down. Well, well, <laughs> or, or, or he's got a he's got a rebuttal. Well, my hit is, <laughs> okay. is, is, is that it, heavy breathing is, is an yeah, indicator. Yeah. Go ahead, doctor. <laughs> My hit is is that it's a sad commentary that the NRA is the only organization well. in a democracy. It has to be the only organization. I def- definitely do not agree with the NRA's politics, and I'm not asking you uh, if you do or not. You know that because that's not not my business. But my point here is is that as a man of color, the NRA to me doesn't uh, concern itself with the issues that I will face. In, this, in, in America, you know, so as a member of the NRA, do you feel alienated by the political stance that that organization stand, uh, takes against people of color? All right, so you talked about a couple of other things. So, yeah. yes, the NRA should not be the only organization. Yeah. You have uh, NAGA, National African American Gun Association. Oh, I appreciate you. Uh, I like so that. I've never am, heard of them. Okay, so so I'm going to introduce you to, okay. to that. Um, uh, there are people that feel that way and people who do recognize that, that there are some um, tension there, and mm-hmm. that's how NAGA was created. So I am the Boston chapter president, okay. and I'm also the regional counselor for the Northeast right here. I need, so some, I need some documentation on them. Right? Well, I, so I, I like that idea. So, like yeah, that. so if you're interested in other, 2A organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, NAGA is a great choice. National African American Gun, Gun Association. Uh, they have over 30,000 members. They're growing. They're about three years old and they're working on getting their um, training um, approved by mm-hmm. the state. So okay. as you know, Massachusetts has a list of approved courses mm-hmm. for you to take your lives to carry. So mm-hmm. I can give my own company courses, but if my company courses are not legally recognized mm-hmm. by the state, mm-hmm. then I'm giving worthless certificates, right? Because yeah, you gotcha. can't use that to apply for the lives to carry. You also have USCCA um, that's out there. Um, but the other issue that the main issue that we're running into is what are those certificates legally recognized as? And the NRA has the jump there, the oldest and largest organization since 1871. Mm-hmm. So what you find, what you find is that these certificates are weaved into law. So um, and, and and that's the challenge that people run into. Well, mm-hmm. I don't think it's a challenge, but but that's one of the main reasons why people you know, use the NRA credentials is because it's legally recognized. And if you don't use them, then what's the other alternative? So so if you don't want me to use the NRA, great, give me another alternative. Yeah. So if you can't, then you really can't complain. Okay. Welcome back to the family, Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so now I'm, so I'm invited back into the barbecue. Well, you, 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 you good. <laughs> so, uh, so as far as my personal views, right? So that goes back to expectations. Do I think white America, or I won't say white America? Do I think racist white America or or, or racist uh, white government is gonna do right by the black community? That answer is no. So I don't have. No, no, not you. Oh, you have a call. I don't have any <laughs> expectation for that. So if racists are going to be racist, and they're going to do what they're going to do. So I'm here to, you know, help the people that I can. If i if you're sitting here waiting for white America to do right by us and white government to, you know, apologize for all the things they've done to, you know, our ancestors and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> you're going to be a skeleton on a man's <laughs> waiting. Oh, yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm, no. No, we had a call. Definitely not waiting. <laughs> yeah. So, so I have no expectation of mm. racist white America to help us or, or aid us or invite us to the table. I'm not asking to be invited to the table. I'm building my own table. You there know. you go. You know, we have our own. You know, I have my own businesses. Uh, we're going to be a six-figure corporation next year, and hopefully, I mean, this year, and hopefully, in a couple of years, that you know, we'll be a seven-figure organization. Mm. So, I'm not waiting on anybody to give us permission or 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 to speak our narrative. I'm taking charge of our narrative. I'm taking charge of our training and i'm doing the work that we need in the in the community so um so i look at it as a means to an end and that the actual reality of being able to give someone a firearm license seeing that person getting a security job right a higher paying security job because they're working armed security or they become a police officer for all that training which has happened to a lot of my students that will always override any type of personal disagreement that i have with the nr so do i have personal disagreements with that NRA? absolutely but Am I going to let that get in the middle of me giving our community, our people who needed the most, the education, training, access, yeah. and resources? The okay. answer to that is no. Very, All right. very, very good response. Right. We have a call. We're going to take that. Uh, good morning, caller. You're welcome to the round table. You're here with our guest, Pierre Solomon, of Solomon of Firearms and Training. You have a question or comment for him? Yes, indeed. This is Jamal Crawford. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. brother Jamal. I think All I know right. this brother. All right. <laughs> So, uh, if so if not, you will soon know him. To Brother Solomon, right? Um, offline, please send me your business information because I want to add you to the uh, Boston Black Business Guide list, right, where we list all black businesses. And we have uh, another one, one of your competition. I won't mention the name out of respect. Um, already there, but the more options I think our people have, are the better. Yeah, so I, I have no competition. I'm only work with anybody and, and everybody. The most Beautiful. business, the biggest classes I've, I've ever done have Beautiful. been in collaboration with other people, so we're all Beautiful. in it together. All right, so yeah, my points. One on the NRA, just on the historical tip. Of course, we know the origins of the NRA, and you know, r you know, rotten from the core, mm -hmm. but what happens is they cornered the market, so it's no different than like, uh, you know, shoot, I got a driver's license from the state of Massachusetts. You know, that it has a, a Indian being subjugated on the doggone license. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, I'm a citizen of America, right? Um, and there's certain things that, you know, when, when you get into particularly these, these very, uh, very specific fields and industries, you know, the NRA has become the, the standard. You know, they are, they, are, they are doggone. It's almost like the IRS. It's not really a government agency, but over the years, it, it, de facto, it has become. So the NRA has de facto almost become the American uh, 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 the agency that deals with guns. And if you weren't a member of it, you know, you would be locked out from certain trainings and, you know, certain benefits and whatnot. So, you know, uh, we forgive you. And in other words, <laughs> right, we, we understand because it's the cost of doing doing business. And if we don't put their politics It's the cost on, of business. You, you, you know don't write I mean? it off. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and then specifically, I want to talk a little bit about my particular story, and if you can give some clarification on this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm 48 years old now. You know, when I was a young man, I was like a lot of young men, and I was caught up out there, you know, selling drugs, and, you know, I had guns. Thankfully, I never got caught with a gun, right? Uh, but, but I was out there, and so I got a record. Now, my last bit of record, you talking about, you know, in my 20s, maybe the 25 or something like that you know i'm done all right uh and now years later none of my felonies quote unquote by the list that i looked at disqualified me from that's no, part of me felonies uh uh, uh uh charges uh disqualified me from owning a gun and i went i went and took the class i got certified i did great i'm a great shot i should have been born in the wild west um and and, and i just couldn't Get the thing, when I went down to BPD, we know traditionally BPD is, you know, is kind of stringent on, on granting 
things. But if you could just go through a little bit about what disqualifies a person, because there's a lot of people like me who might have been a little bit wild as a teenager or in their early 20s, but you're a grown man now. You got you in business. Oh, and then also, too, I'm a victim. I got shot at my house. And now the system tells me I cannot legally own a firearm to protect me, my property, uh, my daughter, so on and so forth. So if you could just talk a little bit about the, uh, the disqualifications and, too, the age-old thing about, oh, well, everybody can own a shotgun. Please yeah. elaborate. Yeah, so um, I think one of the key things that we have to figure out in your situation is you mentioned felony or misdemeanor. So is it a misdemeanor? Is it a charge? Were you convicted? Because right now, as federal law stands, if you get any type of felony, it's a lifetime ban. Now, if you're talking about a misdemeanor or you were accused of a charge and then, you know, it, the the charge got reduced to, you know, a lesser sentence or a lesser charge, then that's a different story from being automatically banned. The other thing, too, I would point you to an organization called com 2 a Common, Commonwealth Second Amendment. Um, they're one of the um, organizations that protect and grow the Second Amendment here through legality. So they go and they sue the state and you know cities and things like that um, to fight for your constitutional right to bear arms. So um, I would I would um, you know inform you to check them out and see you know if they can help you out. They're a nonprofit. They don't charge anything. And their whole goal is hey if we can win this you know this court case then that will provide case precedents and pro and protect everyone else um they recently won a lot of stuff in here in mass you know in mass recently residents have been able to you know carry pepper spray now for having to take a firearm safety course that doesn't carry pepper spray tasers just became you know legal now so we are making strides oh tasers are legal now in massachusetts yeah yeah so so tasers and stun guns are are, are, are legal now so we are so there are people out there fighting for people's right to protect themselves hold on our, elaborate um, on that because a lot of sisters ask me about this when you say legal legal you still you have to get a certification or you don't need a certification anymore for for pepper spray you don't need you don't need to take a ltc uh, course so before um mass law said that you had to have a license to carry to carry pepper spray but um, pepper spray and mace is the same thing yeah so 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 pepper spray yeah it's all based on a compound right whether it's a chemical compound or whether it's organic and stuff like that mm -hmm. but they're pretty much the same thing you know, like same concept where you're spraying somebody in the eyes but yeah yeah so you don't need that anymore you just have to be over 18 years old with a um, qualified government issued id and then you can go and 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 you can get that we also provide pepper spray as well so if you have anybody that's looking for that um we can help them out with that and tasers yeah, and tasers and stun guns now yes as well uh, same thing you don't need any certification so a woman could just go wherever she can buy you can now buy them on it online um, the tasers and the stun guns, I'm not sure about. Um, they were approved last year, and they gave the state a certain amount of period, six months or something like that, to figure out the how they were going to implement that. And, so, and, and, and then, too, do you know if there would be any restrictions? Once again, as a felon, could I have a stun gun? So on the stun gun I aspect, I haven't, you know, okay. looked back up on it. I just know that it was approved, and they gave the state a certain amount of time to figure out how they were going to legally allow people to have the stun guns and and the taser so i'd have to follow up on that if you email me or hit me up on facebook or instagram twitter i will get that answer for you since i don't have it right now and jamal you know this is all these new changes are going to limit your dating pool you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is true so listen listen what pool <laughs> yeah, you can't be but uh but but um and if you could just go back into like you know the lifetime ban and all this okay because so uh, these laws are changing. So, for instance, um, any felony, you know, my, my record is very complicated because most things I went to court for, I ended up beating, right? Okay. Um, and now, So I'm you're good then, so that's not a conviction. So you can well, be charged of anything, but if you're found not guilty, then that doesn't automatically disqualify. Okay, right. But when they wrote me that letter, they had all that in there going back to 1989. So um, uh, that plus, when I was convicted, uh, now... The conviction is no longer illegal in the case of cannabis. See, so there's going to be a lot of new laws at play. Mm -hmm. And now, too, as a person who may be going into the cannabis industry, mm -hmm. right, and I'm limited from the ability to protect myself. Mm -hmm. But I think, Jamal, even, even um, the way that the law is written uh, to a certain degree that it's, it's it limits your ability even if you're there to have firearms on the premises or anything like that even mm -hmm. if you legally and lawfully can can carry a firearm I don't think it allows you 
to have, which I think is kind of crazy because of the the most of that is a cash type of business, and that um, you know unless you hire a police detail. Um, that's what I think is going to have to yes. happen, or or really, I'm worried about the delivery or the transport of the money. That's a good point. Well, the and that's the issue our society always faces is the laws catching up with the society mm-hmm. changing. Mm-hmm. You see that with technology, with the internet, and things like that. Yeah. So as yeah. we as a community is evolving, the laws also have to play catch up. So we are going through a phase of where our criminal justice system and you know ideas and philosophies are changing. And now you know how long is it going to take for the laws to catch up? More states every year. Are are allowing legal and rec- recreational marijuana use. Why happens when all 50 states legalize it? So do I think that's going to change within our lifetime? Yes, but we have to wait till those changes happen. And you can be part of that movement, right? Mm-hmm. You can be part of the movement that's saying, hey, why are black men and, 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 and women and others you know, who were jailed for marijuana are now still in prison while white corporations get to go and profit off of that while our family members are still locked up? You know, What are we going to do about the records? We should be expunging it now now that people are literally making millions and billions of dollars off the industry so we also have to take you know you know do our part in that and making sure that that change happens and and we have to do that by putting pressure on our elected leaders so if we're if we're electing people you know to represent our community and our ideals and values we need to hold them accountable so when that next voting election that next you know you know, term comes up and that person is asking for your vote, you need to hold them accountable and say, hey, what are you going to do? What have you done? And mm-hmm. then follow up on that. So if they do get into office, you know, you need to be right. on them and make but sure like that they're... But to, to Jamal's point, that. you know, and, and, and Jamal, <coughs> uh, please weigh in here. It's like, because like, I, with the Corey reform, that was supposed to address a lot of, not some, because I don't think the cannabis was kind of in play as much as it is now, but that was supposed to address a lot of these things, these, these uh, convictions that people were minor offenses. And I know our current district attorney is trying to eliminate people from being prosecuted for some of these things. She's getting a lot of pushback for that. So, Jamal, like, do you think that the Corey reform should have been part of this conversation as far as addressing these type of uh, convictions that you're talking about? Well, yeah, but but here's one of the things, and it's one of the, uh, the things that people don't get about Corey. If I go apply for a job at Marshalls, Marshalls can't see everything, right? Mm-hmm. But if I want to become a cop... Yeah, yeah. My record don't disappear. Y'all see everything. If I want to go to the Army, if I'm dealing with a federal bid for something, that record don't disappear. It's just who can see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, th- I still think that they can only go so far back, though, when they're making the, the uh, decision, uh, Jamal. Well, like I said, like I said, when I applied for my gun license, the letter that they wrote me back, it's quite mm-hmm. funny. Because they actually reminded me of stuff I forgot that wasn't even on the court. <laughs> okay? Literally, from 1989. I think they I have a form letter years for old you, in Jamal. <laughs> Jamal, you have, to, you have to understand that you are Jamal, and they're very familiar. They, they have a form letter with your name on it down exactly. there. Well, I thought I would be good because, you know, we have a new commissioner now, and okay. ultimately the police chief has to sign off in oh, the area, oh, so man. I thought I was good. Yeah. Contact Com Two A no. Commonwealth Second Amendment and Goal. Um, Com Two A will will provide a legal review of your case, and and if you are accepted, they will cover your charge and, and try to win that case. So they're and, always. And, but then let me ask you too the last thing that distinction because I've always heard that no matter what, like you might not be able to get a handgun or whatever, but no matter what, back to like colonial days or something, everybody is you know is guaranteed to be at least able to have a shotgun or a rifle. So you're talking about the FID card, and that mm-hmm. was something that was recently changed by the old commissioner where they gave law enforcement the, the, the ability to go into a court and then, um, you know, restrict you based on suitability. So Massachusetts has this thing, so, okay, if you don't have a felony, you're not automatically disqualified, but let's say you got into bar fights every weekend. So they could look at you and say, hey, you've been in, like, 20 police reports. You know, We're not going to give you a firearm based on suitability because we think so, that you're someone. So, so, Pierre, what about Jamal's, uh, you know, you, talk, you talked about the the taser and just for people out there, the taser and the, and the pepper spray. Would someone with Jamal described as his past, would he be able to obtain those things? 
I'd have to look at how that law uh, finalized. But yeah, so if the law finalized where you were able to get that, because now it's constitutionally recognized as part of bearing arms, then if that doesn't fall under the category of firearms, the way Massachusetts defines it, then he should be able to do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, mass laws are, are, are really weird. I can't ship pepper spray to someone's door because Massachusetts um, you know, categorizes pepper spray as ammunition, even though it doesn't meet the definition of, mm-hmm. of, of, of ammunition. So I... I have to go and make home deliveries of pepper spray when I, you know, when I should be able to ship it. Mm. So, so you have this contention between state and federal laws, and 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 oftentimes, you know, the the, the citizen ends yeah. up getting screwed because and, of that. And, and also, which, before which we is also going to implicate, mm-hmm. uh, you know, impact right. the marijuana thing because, mm-hmm. as you know, the marijuana federally mm-hmm. versus state, and mm-hmm. it's going to take yeah. a lot longer right. for yep. them to figure yep. it out federally. Exactly. Well, um, than they have state. Right. Okay. But so my last my last little point here, uh, which is really a suggestion this information i think is so critical and so powerful and you know across the country you know with the people i know uh in new york new jersey philly chicago um atlanta texas uh uh black gun ownership black gun clubs are not some strange thing in fact there's like a bunch of them right and uh um one of the most famous, you know, the Huey Newton Gun Club, um, mm-hmm. and some of these folks who are also, you know, very community active. They're doing farming. They're, you know, schools for kids. You know, it's a very, uh, it's all part of the community. And and oftentimes they do conferences on this, you know, dealing with self defense, dealing with this. And I suggest um, that you guys, you know, get get a get a spot. And do like a conference, like RCC or like Reggie Lewis or something, uh, to really talk to people, and particularly in the state that we're in, in this country. Um, um, and this is the part where the NRA gets it right, and I, I get to wave my flag. Yes, the right to bear arms for anybody who legally can, um, in terms of protecting themselves, their property, whatnot, responsible people, well-minded people, grounded people. Um, um, I think that gun ownership for business owners, for, for single women, uh, for families is critical and it shouldn't be a scary thing and I think that the education needs to come about and from what you sound like I think this is great and the legislators our elected officials need to be in on this because they mm-hmm. themselves need to get educated mm-hmm. uh, on all this and oftentimes the people who are talking about this are the irresponsible right wing Republicans and then it all looks crazy and, and weird and then we can't get with it mm-hmm. but, but there is a very strong component of this industry that, that it, it really should be for our people it's not alien to us and it should be promoted and so you know i, I just suggest that you kind of get with some of the other folks uh, if you know the brother don core uh and yep. the folks from mag pro don core is a student of mine shout out to don Be- core beautiful <laughs> so like the, the, the like all of y'all man and 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 a black you know responsible gun ownership uh and self-defense conference something like that that would be huge and i'd be willing to do anything i could do to help that all right, and and before Jamal goes, the uh, your contact information for folks out there listening. Oh yeah, so my phone number, my cell phone number is eight five seven five two three zero seven seven six. My website is solomonfirearms dot com. My That's email Solomon with an A. Yes, S A L O M O N firearms dot com. My email is info at solomonfirearms dot com. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And we are about to go to break. Yeah. Finish that up quick. Uh-huh. So yeah, so you can find me on all the social media platforms. All right, Solomon. Thank you for uh, gracing, gracing the airwaves here at the Boston Praise Radio <laughs> and at the round table. It's been an interesting conversation. We look forward to having you back. Thank you for having me. It's uh, a pleasure. All right, Denise, it's all yours. Yes, thank you all. Bye.